Hi guys, how are you today? My name is Bailey Sarian and today it's Monday, which means murder mystery and makeup Monday. Ugh, let me get comfortable. I need a better chair. So if you're new here, every Monday I've been talking about a crime story that's caught my attention and I sit here, I get ready, I do my makeup and I just tell this crime story. This is my third episode. For the most part, I appreciate your guys' feedback on this little series I got going so far. Plus I get like really into crime stories and I just don't have anyone to talk to about them. So I feel like this is my place to like vent about it, talk about it get off my chest and see what you guys think as well. So I appreciate you guys, you guys when you comment and stuff and give feedback, it's like I'm in a little group discussion. Finally, people who get it. Just a little disclaimer, today's crime story uh, does contain some domestic violence. Some of you were saying if it, if it does, to add a disclaimer pretty much. So another disclaimer, we are gonna talk about murder. So people dying. And this week I thought I should even it out and talk about a girl who killed. Okay, which mind you, it's so much easier to find a man who kills versus a girl. I don't know, ladies, you're really letting me down out there. So I asked Snapchat um, earlier today, like I originally had a story I wanted to talk about and, but it was another dude. And I was like, dude, I need to find a girl who kills. Who, who are some lady killers out there? I should talk about, cause I'm just like, I don't know. It's the same Jodi Arias, what's her name that I'm drawing a blank on that the movie Monster was about. It was just kind of like the same names that I'm familiar with the stories. Casey Anthony was another big one. I'm really familiar with those stories, but I want to find stories that I haven't heard of, you know? On Snapchat, hey, hey, Irene. I'm assuming Irene is your name. Hey, Irene. She reached out to me and said that I should look up Tracy Rohde. I haven't heard of this name and I was like, okay, let me look her up and see what she's all about. So here I am because I, once again, got heavily involved. Tracy Rohde, let's go get into it because the ending of this story is so Tracy Rohde met Scott when they were teenagers. They dated in high school and became high school sweethearts. And at that time they lived in Iowa. So they had been together for a very long time. The couple married in 1990, a few years after Tracy had graduated high school. Scott ended up putting himself through college to become an engineer. And Tracy went to college to become a nurse specializing in childbirth and delivery care. Over the years, the couple ended up having three sons and based off photos of the couple and just the family in general, it seems like typical happy family, all of that stuff that usually isn't true. Tracy had said that there was a different side to Scott. He was very controlling and very jealous. She said it was slowly destroying their marriage, that he was constantly accusing her of having affairs that she wasn't having. So when she was at home, Scott would come into the room where she was at and would ask her like why she was washing her hands. She must be having an affair because she's washing her hands. It was constant. There was a family friend um, who were close to Scott and Tracy. And this family friend had known them for a long time. And she said that Scott was possessive, controlling. He felt like he owned her. He would accuse Tracy of sleeping with different doctors and having affairs with these different doctors that she worked with. And her friend knew that Tracy wasn't having an affair. There's no way. In an interview, Tracy goes on to tell about this one night when she had to stay late at work because she was delivering a baby or something. And she ended up getting home at like midnight. And when she got home, Scott and her kids weren't home. And she was freaking out, trying to call them. She called the emergency room because she thought something had happened to them. She hears the garage door open, in comes Scott. And Scott just goes off on her, accusing her of having an affair. Like that's why she was late. Scott started yelling at Tracy, calling her a tramp and a whore. I'm assuming this was like in front of her kids too. And Scott said that he went looking for her that night to show the kids what a tramp and a whore their mother was. That kind of gives you an idea of their relationship, I guess. So in an interview, they ask Tracy, okay, well then why did you, which I hate this question, you know, when um, you're in a very bad relationship, they always ask, well, why did you stay? Why did you stay if it was so bad? And Tracy said that she stayed because she loved him. He was the father of her babies. She said that they had just as many good times as they did bad times. And to her, it was worth working out. And honestly, like she didn't say this, this is just 
my opinion. Sometimes it's just easier to stay, as like sad as that is. So throughout the years, Scott moved the family five times in 13 years. And the reason he moved so much was to really like, he would get really jealous and accuse Tracy of infidelity to get her away from whomever she was having an affair with. And then eventually they ended up in Texas in 2003. Tracy was far from her friends and from her family. So she felt really secluded or she didn't have anybody. So he got her all to himself. But once they got to Texas, Tracy ended up meeting somebody at her workplace. This time it was for reals. His name was Shawn Michaels and he worked as a unit secretary in the same hospital that Tracy worked at. And Tracy said that he would kind of flirt with her here and there and she always told him, she always told Sean that she was married and Sean would say that he was just kidding. He was just messing around. I guess he just kept doing it, kept flirting with her. And then one afternoon, Tracy and Sean decided to meet in a parking lot. She said that they just stood there, they were talking, hanging out. It was nothing romantic. And then when she went to go say goodbye, Sean leaned in and gave her a kiss. Ugh. Okay, this eyeliner is making my eyelids stick together. So Sean and Tracy ended up kissing in the parking lot. Tracy stands by the fact that she did not have an affair when she was married, but I don't think Tracy knows that like having an emotional affair, I believe counts as an affair. It sounded like she emotionally was falling for this guy and kissing in the parking lot like no it's not the same thing as having sex but in all the interviews she says i did not have an affair i did not have an affair but i think like emotionally she she was into the sean guy she's allowed to, like that's fine whatever anyways moving on so one week later after the the parking lot kiss scott confronts tracy in the bathroom and accuses her of having an affair like he does I guess every other night or whatever. And Tracy says like in the heat of the moment, she just blurts out that yes, she was having an affair and she was falling in love with this guy, Sean. I mean, finally she had the answer he wanted to hear, right? She said for the first time in her life, there was somebody and it wasn't about sex. It was Sean wanted her and cared about her and she just had somebody to talk to. I guess that night when Tracy said that, Scott just looked at her and said, you have no idea what you've done. October 15th, 2003, police were called to the home of Scott and Tracy. Inside the couple's home lay Scott with a gunshot wound to the head. Tracy said in an interview that that morning she woke up really early, like four something in the morning and she went for her morning walk. She came home, she took a shower or she, she started a shower. I don't know if she took the shower and then she heard a moaning sound. It was then she discovered her husband in bed and he was shot. Tracy said that she moved the pillow back and I saw blood and his eyes were swollen and I touched his face and said, Scott, can you hear me? By mid afternoon, it was clear that Scott was brain dead and then he soon passed away. Within hours from the 911 phone call, one of the detectives changed his mind essentially. He said that it seemed like it was an attempted suicide at first, but upon looking onto it a little bit deeper, it shifted to a possible homicide. The detective Detective said that there were all the ingredients of a classic murder plot. There was a love interest, jealousy, a pretty young wife who was behaving suspiciously. That's what he said. Um, the detective said that she was a nurse, but she gave no first aid to her husband whatsoever. And the reason she said she didn't, she didn't give any first aid was because she was in shock. Well, what could she have done? I don't know. Tracy says that he was still breathing, so he she couldn't give him CPR. And that the only thing she could really do was wait for ambulance to come. But the detective said, she's a nurse, you know, she could have gave some kind of first aid. I don't know, maybe covered the hole which he was bleeding from, maybe. But despite the shock that Tracy was in, she still ended up calling into work, told her work that she wasn't gonna be coming in that day and that they needed to find someone to replace her shift. And detectives thought that was weird. Like if you're in shock, why would you call your work and tell them that you're not coming in? So they thought that was a little suspicious. People do the darnest things. 
So like police and everyone were at her house, right? Tracy decides to go and wash her hands. Detectives thought that was weird. Why is she washing her hands? Is she trying to wash off the gunshot residue? Tracy's defense was that she could smell blood on her hands because she did touch her husband. She just wanted to get her hands clean. Tracy said that she went over to the sink. She washed her hands. She just ran hot water over her hands and she stood there and just cried. But the detectives think, suspicious. So while doing some investigating, that's when detectives learned that Scott had hired a divorce attorney. Just one day before the shooting, Scott took Tracy to the divorce attorney's office to have a meeting. And then that's when investigators decided to interview the divorce attorney. So that's where they found out that Scott had this plan. He was gonna take full custody of the kids and Tracy would have liberal visitation. And if she chose to fight, that they would use Sean against her, the guy that she was like not having an affair with, in order to win full custody. So obviously Tracy is shocked. She doesn't wanna lose her kids. She was very upset because Scott never told her that he was gonna do this. And she came back and said that she didn't care if they used Sean against her because she was gonna fight no matter what to get full custody of these children. She said that she loved her children and that she was a good mother and all this was unfair. Tracy then told Scott that they needed to go home and discuss this before moving forward pretty much. The divorce attorney said that Tracy was obviously very upset and that she stormed out of the office. Oh my gosh, no. I just dropped my microphone in foundation. So when they got home, they both agreed that they didn't want to put their kids through an ugly custody battle. Later that night, Scott, his mood had changed apparently and Scott flew into rage. So Scott went and grabbed a baseball bat. He kept asking Tracy, where does Sean live? because he was gonna bash his head in with the baseball bat. And he kept screaming at Tracy, tell me where he lives. And Tracy kept telling him that she doesn't know where he lives. She's never gone to his house before. And then that's when Scott got physical with Tracy. So he grabs her by the throat, puts his fists up to her, told her that he was gonna knock the shit out of her. So once that was over, Tracy goes into the bedroom. She grabs a suitcase. She starts packing and she was just gonna stay in a hotel. Scott started crying and begging her not to go. And he convinced her to like stay. He said, come lay down with me, I'm sorry. And just come like snuggle with me, pretty much. After that altercation, everything was fine. And then the next morning, Scott was found dead by apparent suicide. The detectives spent the next two years trying to find physical evidence to link Tracy to this murder, suicide, sorry. Investigators kept digging until they found a break, something that had been staring them in the face all along. On August 11th, 2005, Tracy was arrested for Scott's murder. You see, the gun and where it was found would become one of the biggest disputes in this case. Tracy said the gun was in his hand and somewhere on the bed and she stood by this story for like her story never changed she was very consistent with her story one of the prosecutors said that the pillow was used in an attempt to muffle the sound that tracy used the pillow to prevent any back spatter from coming back and getting on her hands or the weapon and she also used the pillow to disassociate herself from her husband so prosecutors believed ooh that's what happened. Because if Scott killed himself, when would he have time to put the pillow over his face? What they were, they believed. There was a forensic blood stain expert who poured over police photos taken at the scene. And he reported saying that he took one look at the gun and knew in his mind that it was not a suicide. When Sergeant Pablo Flores, one of the first officers on the scene, he removed the gun. And he said when he removed the gun, the handle of the gun was resting on his left hand and the barrel on his right. He also said that there was no blood on Scott's hands and the gun did not come in contact with any blood on the bed. And yet there was blood around the handle and a thick glob in the actual gun itself. Also, there was no blood on Scott's hands. But from my understanding, if you shoot yourself, I mean, I think, you know, there should be a blood on your hands. In one of the crime scene photos, there's a stain in the carpet of blood and the theory is that the gun was lying in the pool of blood next to the bed. So there was just randomly like 
a pool of blood on the carpet. They think that the gun was originally on the floor and then it was moved to Scott's hands. They believed that Tracy put the gun to his head with the pillow covering it. She shoots the gun. When she did, she dropped the gun landed on the floor and then she waited for her husband to die but then she realized that she made a big mistake and then she picks the gun off of the floor and then she placed it in Scott's hand. In an interview Tracy says that they were just trying to make her out to be a murderer that the gun was never on the floor and she was not lying. Four years after Scott's death, Tracy went on trial. Her relationship with Sean was uh, the center of the prosecution's case because they see this, you know, as a, as a motive pretty much. So they ended up calling Sean the side boo to the stand. No audio recording was allowed during the trial, but he did acknowledge the mutual attraction, but he said over and over again that they did not have a sexual relationship. But Tracy fucked up. 10 days after Scott died, Sean and Tracy checked into the Red Roof Inn, AKA a motel. Tracy says that they did not meet at the hotel to have sex. They met to talk. Apparently they had met at like a pancake house before going to the hotel. And Tracy said she felt really uncomfortable because there were a bunch of police officers around and she felt like she was just being watched. So they decided to leave and go to a motel just to talk. She said she insisted that they were not there to have sex, but things did end up going further that night. And I guess they did have a sexual relationship. You don't go to a hotel to talk. Nobody goes to a hotel to talk. Because if you just wanna talk, you could do that for free in the parking lot or like on the phone, I don't know. There's so many other places to talk. 10 days after he died, they did that, which did not look good. She says that she is fully aware it didn't look good, but she just needed somebody who understood to talk to. Sean and Tracy, their relationship ended up lasting two years. So it lasted for a while after. The prosecution showed that the gun and the gun holster fit perfectly into that stain that was on the carpet. After two days of deliberation, we finally had a verdict. The jury found Tracy guilty of murdering her husband. They think, okay, she had a motive. Scott was gonna take away the kids. She was also having like this emotional affair with Sean. And the only way she was gonna get that is if she got rid of Scott. Okay, but look, listen, she was found guilty, right? But here's the kicker. So in Texas, the defense has the option of letting the jurors decide the punishment as well as the verdict. So they go back to the courtroom for the second phase of the testimony. This time, Tracy took the stand, told the jurors that she did not kill her husband and that she did not agree with their verdict. Also her two older boys took the stand and they told the jurors that they loved their father and their mother and that the mom didn't do it. She needed to be with the kids. Pretty much begged the juror to let her be with them because they needed her. They already lost their dad to a suicide and they need their mother. And it was reported that that really tugged at the hearts of the jurors because these kids are so innocent, so young, and they just, oh, it just really got to them. So that was kind of, I don't wanna say it was smart, but it kind of was. So then the jury went back to deliberate as far as the sentencing goes. So what is she gonna get? Life? couple years was what and then two days later the jurors finally made their decision and girl was it a decision i had to finish my lips completely before telling you the results okay <clears throat> i'm ready i'm ready to tell you so tracy got 10 years probation probation tracy got zero prison time she did spend three days in jail to give her some kind of credit. And she was also fined $10,000. So she was punished hard. Probation means that she cannot leave the county and she has an 8 p.m. curfew. Her nursing license was also revoked and she lost her job. And she stands by the fact that she did not kill her husband. And to this day, she is just, she's out, she's free. Okay, look, my final thoughts on this after reading 
the different um, interviews and stuff, the ev looking at the evidence, I think she did it. There was a good motive. I thought that was weird was like there was no blood on his hands or the gun. The whole thing just seemed kind of weird. I mean, did she go on a run that morning? There was no, nobody like saw her run. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are torn on, on if she did it or if she didn't do it. When you read about the story, all signs are like, yes, she did it. And then when you watch interviews with her, you almost are like, oh, no, she didn't do it. And that's the story of Tracy Rohde. And I believe she's still currently in Texas. She still has her sons and she got, she got off pretty dang easy. And let's be honest here, if that was a man, pretty much anyone other than a pretty white woman, they probably would be in jail right now. Come on, let's all, let's have a moment of honesty here. So I guess moral of the story is if you're gonna kill somebody, do it in Texas because they have that law, the jury can decide your sentence. It's just a little confusing to me how the jury found her guilty, but then they only gave her 10 years probation. I don't know. The whole thing is like freaking weird, right? And that is the story. 10 years probation. So let me know what you think down below. Do you think she did it? I would love to hear what you think about this case and just your thoughts. I hope you have a good day today. You make good choices. Please be safe out there. Take care of yourself, okay? Don't kill anybody today. Anyways, I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.